From a highly secure network of top secret locations across South Texas, this is the Spurs Insider. Training camp is underway. Your usual panel is back. I'm your host, Mike Finger, joined by Express News Spurs beat writers Jeff McDonald and Tom Orsborne, along with sports editor Nick Talbot. We all convened this week, early Monday morning, at the Victory Capital Performance Center. Sparkling new facility, first ever media day at that new facility. Jeff McDonald got the first scoop of the year when he found out from Spurs head coach Greg Popovich. He 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 got the answer we've all been waiting for. Jeff, you you can let everybody know a a a a, a, a key decision has been made in terms of the lineup the Spurs will use this year. What what what'd you get there, Jeff? You could you could hear a pin drop in that place as as Pop made the announcement. Um, the long awaited, uh, we weren't sure mm-hmm. uh, which way he was going here, but apparently um, Victor Wimbanyama has been named to the starting lineup. Wow! So <sighs> Man, yeah, he did not lose his job news. last year. Yeah, throughout the league, ripples of that went out throughout the league yesterday, just from corner to corner of the NBA map. Much like the Carl Anthony Towns, Julius Randle trade the week before. Um, and, uh, aside from that, like what 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 was your big takeaway from Media Day? Aside from the the most obvious announcement of all time, <laughs> we we jest, but we're just a year away from Jeremy being the starting point guard. So <laughs> that's that, that is true. That seems like ages ago, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. There, there, there was a lot to digest from that uh, media day. I wrote about Chris Paul. You wrote about Victor Wimbanyama. Tom wrote about uh, Devin Vassell's foot surgery. Um, you mentioned Mr. Sohan, uh, you know, getting to start the season playing like a position that makes sense instead of point guard um, like he did last year. I just... <laughs> I I don't I don't know if this is where we want to start, but I I just thought it was kind of funny when I I I think it was me that asked Jeremy about uh, you know if he learned anything playing point guard last year, even though it was a failed experiment. I didn't use that term directly, but you know even though it didn't work out, did he learn anything? You know that he might be able to carry forward playing you know at at forward or what forward or a different position. And he says like uh, I I I learned how. <laughs> I learned how to look for the light in the darkness or something like that. Like it's just I, so like uh, emo. Like yeah. I was expecting like, oh uh, yeah, I learned how to like, uh, you know, handle the ball a little better. I learned to make reads, this or that. He he went completely to his, his psyche. Jeremy, you know? uh, Jeremy's a bit dramatic. I think we've, we've uh, learned that the first couple of years he's been around. I, I was sitting there thinking the same thing uh, just about like, <laughs> it sounds like some, it sounded like, the words of uh, a, a person talking about like the greatest tragedy in his life or whatever it it, it seemed like a lot. It sounded uh, like a death cab for cutie song. <laughs> yes, yes, it did. Uh, but it like if the, that's the that's the way he saw it. That's the way he processed it. Maybe it'll work out for him. He found the light in the darkness. Uh, the darkness being uh, for some of us. Darkness means certain things for him. Darkness meant getting paid millions of dollars to play a position in the NBA that he hasn't played before. So uh, we'll see how he handles that. You mentioned quickly there, uh, Tom Orsborn give, writing a uh, Devin Vassell update for the newspaper this week. The Express News available everywhere. Expressnews.com. Um, that is that hat. That was the preseason news. That was the news um, about the local cagers since we last podcasted that the starting shooting guard, um, pretty clearly one of the two best players on this team, is going to be sitting out when the season begins later this month. Tom, since you wrote about it, just give us the quick rundown. Uh, about what people need to know about Devin Vassell's injury when he had his surgery, why he had his surgery, when he's going to be back. Yeah, he um, he answered a question that a lot of us had because when we when you guys last spoke to him, I was I was down with COVID. But when you guys last talked to him uh, after the finale against uh, Detroit, and he was he missed the last eight games, but he met with the media after that game, and he said that you know he thought the the foot would be fine. He had a stress fracture in his right foot, thought things would work out. 
organically that it would heal on its own. Um, but so the question was, why did he have surgery? And it occurred on June 26, and he explained it just wasn't healing on its own. So they went in, cleaned it up, you know, repaired it surgically. It's not, you know, a career-threatening injury by any any means. Um, he'll be reevaluated on November 1st. In all likelihood, he'll miss the first five games and then come back at some point after that. And call also, oh, sorry. he also said he doesn't want to push it. You know, if, if the medical staff says, hey, you need, need some more time off, he'll take it. You know, he doesn't want to, you know, make it even worse than it, than it is. Doesn't want to have another setback. They're, and they're calling it a stress reaction, which I guess is not so um, bad as a stress fracture. It's like a stress fracture waiting to happen. So just to clarify that, yeah, I went back and listened to, um, you know, when the Spurs announced that, I went back and listened to the the post-game interview from the season finale against the Pistons. And I asked Stefan, like, so you're going to have a normal offseason. Yep, normal offseason, not expecting anything. You know, I, I, the quote was, it's just getting better. It's just been getting better and better. Uh, just needs rest, ice, and recovery. Um, we're just going to let it heat on its own. Um, we ask those questions a lot, and to, to find out two months later he needed surgery is is unfortunate. Like if if he could have had that surgery even a month earlier, it's not threatening the start of his season. So it's you know, it's just unfortunate. Bad luck, bad timing. Not not sure what the disconnect was there or 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 what, but uh, you know it does it is bad timing that he's going to miss games to start the season. This is a loaded term. I realize that up front. I acknowledge. Um, 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 creating a media controversy here, perhaps, but is Devin Vassell an injury prone player? I can see both sides of that question because it does seem like he's already always getting surgery, like little minor surgeries for this, that, and the other. But he's really only had one year where he's just missed a ton of games. Yeah, just one. I, you you caught me off guard, but I can pull it up right here. Um. Because I remember having this discussion with people last year, and it feels that way. But he just had that one game, one year where he only played in 38 games. But the rest of them, you know, he's played, you know, 62 as a rookie, and that was the COVID short year. 71 his second year. Um, then he had the 38 games his third year. I guess last year he was limited to 68 because he missed the final eight with that, um, the foot injury that he's just now getting cleaned up so i guess to answer your question it's kind of in the eye of the beholder right what do you consider injury prone how many how many missed games per year are you sort of uh, you know can you he's have missed at least a, he's missed at least 10 and i realized 10 especially in the modern nba is that's a, that's a, the point, a yeah. whole lot but he's missed at least 10, 10 11 a year right yeah uh, yeah how and a half uh, a season one time yeah i forget the rookie the co that's covid shortened year not the year that was interrupted by covid but the following year, they started late and played a shortened schedule. I forget how many games were on that schedule. Right. So I don't know how many he missed that year, but he played 62 as a rookie in that situation. Yeah. Uh, reading between the lines of uh, the way the, the Devin is talking about this, the way the Spurs are talking about this, um, just, just seems like he's not going to be back on November 1st. The way they're saying is that's when he'll be reevaluated. Um so I, I anticipate this This isn't to be aggregated. I don't think this is breaking news in any way, but just the the verbiage they're using, um, it seems like the reevaluation on November 1st means that when, that's when we get the next timetable. Yeah. To, he'll be back this but, week or he'll be back in two weeks or what have you. Right. Like, I, I guess I guess it's possible that he could, that new timetable would be, that new reevaluation, reevaluation would be, hey, he's ready today. I have a, uh, but I, I wouldn't a, bet on that. Yeah. Well, I have a, yeah, I wouldn't, well, I don't know. I wouldn't bet on anything, but, um, don't bet one, people. One, it's the one, worst. One thing I'll point out, out is the Spurs never do that. They never give you a timetable. They right. never say we're going to reevaluate them on this date and then we're going to give you another up. They never do that. The reason they did it this time is because they, they're fairly certain that it's, it's going to be in that neck of the woods where he'll, he'll, he'll be back. They, they, they didn't want to not give anything and people think he's out three months. Right. So they gave, uh, the, I've been told the reason they put the November one time uh, uh, date on there is to sort of signal this is more of a short-term thing than a long-term thing. Does that mean on November 1st, they're going to say he's playing in the next game? 
maybe, maybe not. But I think unless there's some sort of setback, um, it'll be not long after November 1st that he's on the floor. That's good to know. In the meantime, we have a uh, we have an open roster spot to discuss or an open starting spot to discuss. And there's all kinds of different uh, ways that Greg Popovich and his staff could go about filling that spot. And we'll we'll uh, preface this conversation by, I think we can all agree on the premise that alongside Victor Wembanyama in the starting lineup, you will see Chris Paul, you will see Jeremy Sohan, and you will see Harrison Barnes. Like I would be surprised if those three guys aren't starting. Uh, can we agree on that? And and if we can, then who's who are your favorites to fill in? the Devin Vassell spot? Um, my, like, this is just my guess. Like, this is my, like, if, if I had to bet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Don't um, bet, people. I Go would, ahead. I think, I, I think it would be uh, Champagne. Yep. Because that's, he kind of did that all last year. And also, uh, just, just Pop's MO for these short, sort of short-term starter things is, um, you try to keep everybody else in the role that you want them to fill for yep. the whole season. So people might say, well, just now Keldon can start to begin the season. Well, no, they want Keldon to be the sixth man for the entire season. So they don't want him to start the season playing five games in the starting lineup and then have to move to the bench. This is just my my theory. But you take Same a Julian Champagne. What's, what's that? Same thing with Castle. Yeah. Don't throw him in there to a spot that he's not going to be sticking with. Yeah. Um, get him comfortable with the role that you want him to play as a rookie coming off the, the way, bench. the way pop has almost always approached these kind of things is you don't, you don't elevate your sixth man to the starting lineup. When someone's injured, you elevate like your 10th man yep. to the starting lineup when someone's injured. And so that's why I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to place my bet on <laughs> Julian Champagne uh, for that reason. And the fact that he started 60 some odd games there last year. It's a opportunity for Malachi Branham. Uh, of course, um, you know, he's been in, inconsistent uh, in his play, but maybe, you know, maybe he's ready to. That would be my second guess, maybe. Too. Tell a leap. And uh, speaking of those two, uh, always link uh, Branham and Blake Wesley together out of the same draft class, number 20 and number 25, I believe. Harrison Barnes, just unsolicited, gave a, as he put it, a shout out to Blake Wesley for what he's been showing in uh, open gym and the defense that, you know, we knew he was, that's his calling card is defense, but apparently he's stepped that up even more according to Mr. Barnes. It's a big month for both of those guys. And, and I mean specifically a month because yeah. um, we're about a month away from the, from the decision date on whether the Spurs guarantee their contracts next year. And I don't think I don't think either one of those decisions is 100% right now. I think Malachi Branham is more likely. That Blake Wesley one I'm not sure about. And the the Vassell injury, even if neither one of those guys step into the starting lineup, that opens a spot in the 10-man rotation, if you will. Like you can't – no NBA team plays more than 10 guys regularly. And before Devin Vassell went out, it was – up in the air as to whether there's room in that top 10 for either Malachi Branham or Blake Wesley. Now I'd, I would expect one of them, if not both of them to get some early season run uh, for sure to get some preseason, a lot of preseason run. And uh, I, I suspect that the Spurs already know which way they're leaning uh, on, on those contract decisions with both Blake Wesley and Malachi Branham. But if, for some reason they are on the fence if for some reason they're leaning against keeping or or uh what what is it nailing down the option uh yeah uh, on on those guys like a uh, preseason could um put them over the top so yeah Blake West, Wesley Malachi Branham are they part of the future we don't know yet but they they could have a big month here yeah just to clarify for the viewers and listeners and readers at home just just how this works uh, Malachi Branham and Blake Wesley are both under contract already for the season that's about to start. Yeah. By the end of October, the Spurs have to decide if they want to pick up their options for next season. Um, you know, the season that starts in in 2025. 
And yep. uh, basically you're deciding if you want to keep them around past the season that's coming up. And They're eventually there's going to be five eventually, million, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. And eventually there's, it's not a lot of money for each of those guys. Mm-hmm. I don't think, but um, you're getting to a spot where there's going to be an upcoming roster crunch. If you have all these draft picks that you're adding, I mean, how many draft picks can the Spurs have next summer? Is it three in the yeah, first well, round? I think, Something like I think that. They, I mean, like they possibly could have four, but Charlotte's possibly. not going to happen, but just, yeah, you have multiple draft picks there, and you're already kind of, as we can see, discussing this year's roster. You're a little, there's already a little bit of a crunch. We don't know how those guys, Blake or Malachi, are going to get minutes if you know when the team's fully healthy when Vassell's back. So that's kind of one thing you're looking at: is there even room on the roster for those guys after this season? And they're going to have to, you know, earn it. And maybe, maybe. Part of it is the Spurs can't keep them, but they're auditioning for other teams throughout the season, and to to have someone yep. come out come after them next summer, and that guaranteed money, you know, the the four million dollars, it 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 it's not a lot of money, but it could play into um, cap space next summer Absolutely. because because uh, you know you're you're looking at maybe twenty five thirty million in cap space, and and you you knock. Blake Wesley's four million off of that, and that opens up a little bit more and uh to to sign like a legitimate right. star player there. Every, and every summer di- you're basically different... you're trying to like carve as every nickel of cap right. space that you can. And if you have a four million dollar player on there that you don't even want to keep, it makes it harder. Right, right. So just to to summarize here with it's it's a matter of are you guaranteeing that money to those guys next season? And um, that will be something to watch in the weeks to come. Uh, something else, what, who, who else have we not mentioned from Media Day yesterday? I guess we did mention him in passing, but uh, Keldon Johnson with his slimmer body, new number, um, familiar role coming off the bench. What's what's kind of the Cliff's Notes version of the Clay, uh, Keldon Johnson situation? I guess we can start with the fact that he was there because he was the rumored trade piece all summer, but he's back with his his typical Keldon Johnson attitude. He tried to counsel Jeff McDonald yesterday on diet. I'm not sure did did that message hit home for you or I, when I what, asked him how, how he how he lost all the weight, I was hoping he'd say Ozempic because <laughs> that's so that's what I was hoping that like I asked him because I wanted to do what he did. He said uh-huh. diet and exercise, which come on, man. Yeah, a, work with me a little. It was a yeah. bad day for Bucky's. <laughs> <laughs> that was um, his, his go-to place for barbecue. What? What? Where? What is the state of Kelvin Johnson these Man, days? I don't know. He's kind just, of a fascinating he, player. And I don't. Yeah, and I don't know what to say about him. It's just kind of status quo, right? Is is he adding anything this year? Is he going to be a different player? Is he I, I, at, in year six? I think what we've seen from him is what you get. And I, in some ways I think he's polarizing among the fan base. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but that's the sense I get. Uh, He seems like a guy that can help you off the bench and that's where he is. Um, Every so often he's going to pop off for 20 points. It's nice to have those guys, uh, you know, around on the bench. I don't think he's like uh, indispensable. That's why he was, his name came up on in a trade trade rumors and the trade Rumor mill over the summer, probably hear more of that going through this season to the trade deadline in February. But while, while he's here, he's a he's a guy that can help you, I think. Not going to, you know, he's not going to, def- he's not going to help you on defense. Um, Three point shot comes and goes, but he can, he can get buckets every now and then. I guess that's my. I, I think it was probably the third media day in a row in which he's talked about improving defensively. And that's, that's the. To me, that's the biggest negative that the coaching staff looks at. It's just, you know, his liability in that area, shortcomings in that area. When when Jeff mentioned the word polarizing, I think the part of the dynamic here is is he was he was taken at the end of the first round, where you typically don't find, um, you know, the, if if you just look at the historical average of the impact of a guy taking, was he another twenty ninth pick? 20, he was in he was in the mid 20s 29 yeah he's 29 29 um like those guys don't make rosters all the time um beyond the first you know the first contract they don't stick in rotations all the time they don't become regulars 
And there was a period there, you know, his second, third year when it was like, this is, this could be a foundational piece. He had been such a success story early on. And I think he almost got overhyped in a way. But if you look at, if you go back to the year when he was taken 29th overall and said on draft night, that night, the same draft when they took Luka Samanich in a, a half a draft, half a round earlier, that these are Kelton Johnson's stats. This is what he's going to do over the next six years. Like the Spurs and all their fans would have taken that in a heartbeat. Like that's, that's a huge win, draft win to have this guy. It, he's just become sort of like the perception of him has been, oh, he's underperforming because right. you see all these holes in his game that you, that you guys have mentioned um, in recent years. So and and that that happens with other guys too. Yeah. You know, you get some early run, you get some early hype, and then you don't become an all star. Like there's going to be some disappointment there, and that's fair. But he's, um, he's it, become he's it, just a weird. It's a weird player. It's a weird story. Just because of all of those factors, he's become an ab- absolutely a solid NBA rotation player. Yes, and to get, and to yes. get that at 29 is is good. I, th- mm-hmm. I think what you, what you said is spot on. There was a period in there where. People were looking at him as a foundational piece, you know, before even before DeJounte Murray made the all-star team. I remember people saying Keldon Johnson could be the next Spurs all-star. And when you're looking at a guy through those glasses, all of a sudden, all their all their all their flaws do become a lot more glaring than when you're looking at, hey, this was the 29th pick who has become a really solid um, rotational player. That's how the Spurs are using him now. He's not even starting. He's coming off the bench. He's a bench kind of energy guy he fits i think there were some growing pains into that role last year but that's where he belongs and when you look at it through that lens i mean he's he's they 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 did well at that 29 pick and i tell you what if they had taken him at 19 instead of luca i would have still said they did well yeah um what, what was also you talk about the lens we look through i remember reading um earlier this summer when the the Lowry Markinen rumors were out there and you know is is Utah going to trade him before they sign him to the extension um and uh, you know when there were some proposals out there the various teams that might have had interest in in Markinen there was some story um online somewhere where uh, someone in Utah was asking would the Spurs be willing to include Kelvin Johnson in this deal because look at look at how well he's done for five years and look at his solid stats and all this kind of stuff. And it was almost jarring to read that um, because we're in this echo chamber of how disappointing Keldon has been in recent years in San Antonio, that still, when you look at him from outside, it's like, Hey, that's this, that's been a productive NBA player. That could be uh, something that the Utah jazz would want. Like, like it, it, sometimes you need to step back and and look at it from the outside like there are teams around the league that consider Keldon Johnson a productive guy a a desirable guy and and that might play into more talks in the next year or so I would think also this echo chamber you mentioned is that just Twitter or whatever they call that website now uh I I think it's beyond I think it's like like, do you you think if you're sitting in the at this in the stands at the Frost Bank Center everyone's grumbling about how how bad Keldon Johnson is playing well we talked about this before I think there's those are the extremes like just the average the average fan who's coming there with his office like his office he got his office seats that night um who's just going to come check out a Spurs game the the absolute casual um you know guy watching the Spurs in the bar or whatever and then the obsessives on Twitter those are the two extremes I think there's a lot of of uh a lot of fans are in between those so uh, I don't know any. <laughs> well, you don't know people. That's true. Um, anyway, uh, that's probably enough Keldon Johnson talk for this podcast. And we've been 15 minutes here and in, and we haven't talked about the two most famous players on the roster. Well, who, who do you want to start with? Sandro uh, Mamos uh, Yeah. Um, you wrote Chris Paul. What? Well, what's what's the what's the Chris Paul story? Um, I'm, I'm just kind of fascinated by how this is going to play out or look like I'm, uh, you know, as a person who enjoys watching basketball, I think it's going to be exciting to see, um, 
someone who knows what they're doing run the show with Victor Wembanyama, you know, benefiting from that. I think I think it could be like a, a Lob City times two or whatever, take two. Um, mm-hmm. I'm just interested in it. I, you know, I I don't. He, he's not going to play. Chris is not going to play 82 games. I think I can. Again, I would be willing to bet on that right now. Don't he has bad people. He hasn't. <laughs> You're 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 ruining our chance to get a sponsor here, you know, because that's true. That's the only people that are going to sponsor this stuff is the uh, fan duels of the world. But anyway, um, like I was looking it up, he Chris hasn't played in a ton of games in a long time. Like you talked about Devin Vassell, Chris Paul played 82 games in 2014 and 15. And then he's basically missed at least 10 games every season since. He's also almost 40. Yeah, exactly. So my point is he's not gonna yeah. he's not gonna make it to 82. So um there's gonna be a lot of like filling in the blanks behind him. Uh you know, we haven't seen the last of Trey Jones as a starter. There's gonna be a lot of fill in starts for Trey. But it's just kind of it's just kind of a fascinating dynamic to me to see this guy come in at, at like you said, nearly 40. Hall of Famer, point guard of his generation, and he's going to spend what might be the last season of his career. We don't know, but it might be the last season of, of his career, basically, um, you know, teaching this young team how to hoop, but and also hooping himself, as he said, that's kind of important to him is to, if he's going to leave his family for a season, he wants to play and not watch. So not just the, kind of important. He he, the he repeated priority. the same it's- the same things he said when he came to San Antonio was at the first week of July, Tom, mm-hmm. when Je- Jeff yeah. was in Sacramento at the summer league and Chris came in for his mm-hmm. press conference. Then he repeated all the same. He had the same notes same at media problem. day this week and that it's not that it it's almost like he was so candid. It was it was shocking and that people ask him, you know, why did he choose the Spurs multiple times, by the way? And and the, the point is like his point was that that's where I could play. <laughs> it wasn't anything beyond that. Does he respect Greg Popovich? Of course. Does he have um, uh, the admiration for everything the organization has stood for over the years? Absolutely. But he wanted to play point guard. He wanted to play basketball. And this Monster was the who? place that let him do it. Monster and who? it's as simple as that. Yeah. And 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 in terms of him uh, teaching and mentoring, um He'll do some of that, but th- yeah. that's not why he's here either. Yeah. He's, here to, he's here to play, and just by being Chris Paul, as Greg Popovich exactly. said, just by being in the locker room and being on the court and being in the huddle in those last two minutes, that's that's what this comes down to for this team. With both Harrison Barnes, Chris Paul, um, you know, the added experience of all the 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 Jeremy Sohans, uh, Victor Wembanyama, uh, even Devin Vassell. Like it comes down to the last two minutes of competitive games. How many games did we watch last year where the Spurs were in it and then just didn't know what to do in the crunch in it in the clutch in the crunch time? Um, that's where the difference can be made. Yeah. If when Chris Paul is out there acting like he's been there before, uh, by osmosis, does that kind of permeate the rest of the roster, the rest of the lineup? Like. That's going to be the fun thing to watch is, is are the Spurs able to win these games that they did not win? In the Spurs days? lost 28 crunch time games last year, which was tied for most in the league. How many of those, like if you just had to guess a percentage, how many would they, would they have won had Chris Paul been on the floor for those crunch time minutes? Like a quarter, I mean, they even, if a it's quarter. A, even if it's a third of them. Yeah, I was going to say if them. they win a quarter of them, that's almost a 30-win season. Yeah. Well, and he, he used a great description – of what he can bring, you know, he said he wants to bring a sense of calmness sense in those calm, situations, yeah. and that that was a great way to illustrate what the Spurs haven't had. In this yeah. Oh yeah, it gets. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, Tom, you might have covered the game, but if I feel like uh, this one of those crunch time games the Spurs lost was against the Warriors, and Chris Paul is the reason the Spurs lost it because he, oh yeah, I yes. seem to recall he had a big fourth quarter against them. Yeah. Yep. That was at home. Uh. I remember that well. It was just Chris Paul doing Chris Paul things. And that was the, you know, you put him on the other roster and that that's one specific game that absolutely yep. the outcome would have changed. So and maybe he only plays 60 games, just health wise. I mean, but those, those 60 games, he can make a difference in for sure. We'll, we'll wrap up this week uh, with uh, 
with the star player, with the guy that we talked about all summer and uh, that we'll talk Mama. about every week with Mama. And also uh, with Victor Wimbanyama, the, uh, the thing that stood out to me from his availability at Media Day, um, Jeff had asked Victor, I think it was the Jeff question about uh, what he, what, what part of his game is going to improve, what he worked on this summer. And uh, this, this, this guy is just the NBA viral sensation when he, yeah. he's the guy that every night does three things that veteran players, you know, LeBron, the LeBron James is the Kevin Durant's, the Steph Curry's of the world, just shake their heads and think, how in the heck did he do that? You know, whether it's like passing the ball off the backboard into a dunk or the God sham God from a seven foot three guy on the wing, you know, one handed crossover, uh, behind the back passes between the leg dribbles, the, the outstretched Gumby dunks. What he worked on, he said, is is making an advantage of simple situations. And I just think that is so Spurs like. And it really is the part of the game, part of his game that was missing. And it sounds outrageous to say that a part of his game was miss- missing last year because he did everything. He had one of the most dominant rookie seasons of all time. But he did not have that go to. Um, move that go to kind of mentality where Jeff covered over a decade of Tim Duncan when the game was on the line, when they needed a bucket, you could dump the ball into boring Tim Duncan and he'd use the same boring move that he used over and over and over again and got you a bucket. Victor didn't have one of those, just a boring go to I'm, I'm taller than the guy guarding me and I'm going to score on him. And I think it's really encouraging for Spurs fans to know that that's kind of what he's working on now. Um, I had a I had a, a staffer tell me last year, it was midway through the season, uh, a staffer with the Spurs who's been there a long time. And he said, when with the moment that Victor Wembanyama figures out what Tim Duncan figured out about just how to how to have a go to move that gets him to the foul line over and over that people can't stop. Our games are going to get really, really boring. <laughs> and it's true. Like that if, if he just like, I love the pull up three pointers. I love the off the backboard passes. I love all that stuff. It's fun to watch. It's fun to cover. But if he just has that boring go to Tim Duncan swim move, that's going to get him to the foul line, you know, just to finish at the, at the, at the, at the basket, like he's going to be unstoppable. Um, and so that's what stood out to me from media day. That's where I'm going to finish. It's, it's my, okay, uh, it's my okay for him day. to be, for him to be part Tim Duncan and part Mono Ginobili. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's good. Yeah. You can, have, you can have some flash in there. That's okay. Yeah. But the, um, the other part is right too. And the reason the games are going to get boring when Victor figures it out is because he's going to shoot like 20 free throws a game. That's yes. Team, teams, exactly. teams aren't going to know what to do and they're just going to foul. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I think that having a Chris Paul around will sort of um, uh, help that process. Like, uh, like it's it's he's going to consistently get the ball in situations where he has those advantages that he talked about. Um, and just if it's if it's a step closer to the basket, if it's in just a a a a, a, a foot better of a situation that he had last year if it's if the lob is just a few inches more on target like those little advantages are going to add up and uh like as much as victor Wembanyama dazzled us last year like the the potential for him to be significantly better is is really tantalizing and uh and, and exciting to think about so 25 wins this year <laughs> We'll see. We'll see. That was um, interesting that they, uh, you know, they were asked, you know, various people, uh, Pop and players asked about expectations. And Pop, uh, Pop went know, back to the very cautious, yeah, went general, back. general platitudes. Remember the last two years? Yes. Or especially last year where it was winning's important, winning's a priority. Remember that at Media Day? Yeah. Last and summer. The year before it was don't, don't go crazy in Vegas. Yeah. 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 So now, he, it's just, now it's just it's the same as always. 
Yeah. Same as here. The, the, well, the here's the mentioned uh, Devin Vassell said playoffs. Yeah, That's I don't know what the players are supposed on. to say. Yeah. yeah. If the here's play, the thing if about the players that. say thirty wins is their goal, that would be a problem. If you could go back and look up the the quotes from last year, not just with the Spurs, but at twenty nine other teams, um, like those, the whole Joe Namath thing uh, from back in Tom's day, like that was a big deal back then. But now it's just like these these predictions are a dime a dozen, and it's not necessarily the player's problem. It's just that like at a at a media day like that. Of course, that's what he's supposed to say. What do you expect, Devin? Oh, it's playoffs. Playoffs are nothing. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that, that if, doesn't if, hold. I don't get really. I, I don't put a whole lot of stock into that. If because like, it's Devin, what they're if, supposed to say, and it's not that bold right. anymore. If, if if Devin had said, "Well, I'm hoping we can win 30 games," that would almost be a better quote because, <laughs> yes, like you're, you're not supposed to say that. You're right. supposed to have higher hopes than that. The pop thing was interesting to me though too because we kind of brought that up a lot last year. How at Media Day he said, you know, last year was about learning, but this year is about winning. And they went went and won the exact same number of games. Yeah. 22. And we brought that yeah. up so many times last year. And this year, when basically asked the same question, he basically punted it. He punted the answer, just gave some Well, he had no choice. Like you you can't <laughs> you can't I think he was self aware enough to, to realize right. he can't repeat what he said last year. <laughs> Do you think he remembers what he said last year? I'm not even. Being well, I, I don't. I I think he does, and I because th- I think we brought it up with him on in countless pregames. It was brought. Do you up think to him. he remembers those countless pregames? I think he does. I think there's a million of them. Credit. I barely remember them. With the arena push, good. the arena push on there, there's got to be a little bit of a sense of urgency. I would think. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we'll we don't have to do uh, season predictions. This week, uh, we'll have oh, yeah. Let's see how the pod- preseason goes. We'll have multiple podcasts in the preseason. We will we will be back at you, um, in your digital players we, throughout this predict- month. A big thing that I wanted to point out that our producer, uh, Nick, our sports editor Nick Nick Talbot wanted me to point out before we go is next Thursday, October the tenth. We're going to do another En Vivo, where all of us beautiful people are going to gather in the studio in one secure location. It's going to be on camera, and it's going to be, for those of you out there uh, uh, who who are bilingual, you know that En Vivo means live. We're going to be live like we were. We did this once last, last season at some point. Um, in the studio, we're going to take your questions, and if you want to hit the the uh, notes, the show notes, either in YouTube or in Spotify or however you listen to this podcast, there's going to be a link there to send some questions in advance for Jeff and Tom and uh, the, your 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 friendly host here to to answer in vivo on October 10th. I believe it's going to be at 1 p.m. Central, but looking forward to that. Um, that should be another fun gathering. And we will be live on camera like people get to see us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I have to put on pants for this. Well, last time we did it, Tom wore shorts. Um, and I think that we need to. Uh, well, that we was for the ladies. That issue we need to do something for the for the ladies. <laughs> okay. But that that should be fun. October the tenth, at the secure location on camera, answering your questions. Send those questions in advance to that link in the show notes. Um, there'll be all other links on expressnews.com in the uh, in the days to come uh we will see you then until then take care of each other and keep it real <laughs> <laughs>